Ah, oh, there you are, Ross. And about time, too. Right, now pay attention. You're going to need this, and this, and, oh, be careful, Ross, and this. Look, that's not a toy. And, of course, this. Right, in again. I want this back in pristine order, not like the others. I'm a caring, sharing man of the 90s, but I feel it's time to put my hands up and say, yes, I am a James Bond fan. You can keep your Terminator 2s and your Die Hard 3s. The recently released Goldeneye is James Bond 17. And in the 33 years since Doctor No, two and a half billion people have paid to see the most popular film series of all time. Pierce Brosnan is officially the fifth Bond, although we mustn't forget that the mighty Bob Holness once played him on radio in the 1950s. Tonight, I aim to find out just who James Bond is, how he still manages to beat the living daylights out of the competition, and whether or not even he knows how to set his VCR to recall stars in their eyes when he goes away for two weeks in the sun. But first of all, I wonder if it's possible to sum up the appeal of James Bond in less than, say, ten words? Yes, I mean, he's, he's the ultimate fantasy character for the guys. James Bond got to do all the fun things. You know, he got, he, I just watched those movies going, wow, that's amazing. He's, he's, he's on skis, and then he turns that turns into a car, and that flies away to whatever. I mean, it's just amazing. A good guy who's rather flawed in many ways when you think of the original Bond, you know, a guy who smokes and drinks and kills and womanizes and all the rest of it. No. Says <laughs> Vivi. Looks like you're out to get me. It's an idea at that. He just got everything right, and you what wine to order, and he was cool, and he was dead sophisticated and handsome. The girls loved him, but if things got out of hand, he could beat the shit out of you. <laughs> 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 I mean, he used women for shields. I mean, if there a bullet heading his way or a spear, I think he'd swing her around and say, sorry, love, but I guess it's your unlucky day. Do you mind if my friend sits this one out? She's just dead. If there's one person who knows Bond better than anyone, it's the man who played him the most. The man who stylishly donned that tux no fewer than seven times as 007. Roger, I imagine that um, after your successful stint as the saint and being possessed of huge male beauty mm. and charisma, you were an obvious choice <laughs> <laughs> to be Bond. But um, 
did you feel that it was a, a sort of a difficult role to take on? Were you at all worried about filling the shoes of Mr. Connolly? Uh, well, no, no, not really. You know, sort of, I figured, you know, a thousand actors over the years have played Hamlet, so why shouldn't another actor have a go at something somebody else was very well established in? My name's Bond. James Bond. I know who you are, what you are, and why you have come. Obviously, it's a great part to play, but did the fact that you were going to be whizzing around to incredibly exotic locations and snuggling up to some of the world's most beautiful women, was that a, a, a factor in accepting this position? Well, that's why I did it for so little money. <laughs> Detente can be beautiful. This is no time to be discussing politics. I had myself done a lot of uh, movement in, uh, in training with Yat Malgram. I've uh, come to offer my sincere condolences. <coughs> and I think that the movement of Bond, the kind of dance of him in the films, has a lot to do with it. I don't think you should have opened that car door by yourself. When I say dance, I don't mean ponching around and uh, that sort of way, but just how the movement in scenes. To many people, mm. Sean is the definitive mm. Bond. Um, mm. Do you feel that way about him? Do you think that Absolutely, is? absolutely. I mean, when Roger played it, he played it much more sort of tongue-in-cheek. I think rightly, because with great respect to Roger, that's his line, and he's not a great butch, virile character. With Sean, you had the physical presence and the hint of cruelty, yeah. which is in Bond's dark side. It's a Smith and Wesson, and you've had your six. <laughs> With Roger, you had the, the flip side, the humour, the charm. The flares. Exactly. Love was lesson number two. Togetherness. Till death do us part, or thereabouts. Is there time before we leave? For lesson number three. Absolutely. There's no sense in going off half-cocked. And uh, with Tim Dalton, you had the theatrical credits. I haven't finished here, sir. Leave it to the Americans. It's their mess. Let them clear it up. Sir, they're not going to do anything. I owe it to Leiter. He's put his life on the line for me many times. Oh, spare me this sentimental rubbish. You have an assignment. And I expect you to carry it out objectively and professionally. Then you have my resignation, sir. We're not a country club, 007. I think Tim did bring something very much to it. There was a sort oh, of, a, yes. there was a gritty oh, meanness. Yes. So did George Lazenby. You know, a lot of people have sort of slightly dismissed George Lazenby and said, oh, well, he only did it once and he wasn't, you know, what we thought of as Bond. <laughs> this never happened to the other fella. I personally don't think the perfect James Bond has ever appeared on the screen, but that's purely my opinion. Your Bond, when you were Bond, there was a, a, perhaps a slightly more human element. Well, it had to be because he, he uh, fell in love, where Bond looked, uh, you know, uh, like he had too much armor plating on to fall in love prior to um, Diana Rigg coming on or the Contessa. I think to be able to transform from James Bond into a guy who's emotionally involved with a woman, you had to have a, a softer side to you. Are you sure, Jane? I love you. I know I'll never find another girl like you. Will you marry me? Why didn't you do any more? What actually happened? I had this mentor. I won't mention his name, but he talked me out of doing another Bond picture, saying, you're famous now, you can go on as an actor. Uh, and, of course, I wasn't an actor after doing one James Bond picture, so I was in no man's land. 
But looking back, I mean, even you turn the story now, this it sounds insane. It was insane. I mean, I wasn't very bright. And I'm meeting all these people who are the heaviest hitters in the world who are opening their doors to me. Well, my mind went into neutral, and, and I thought, this is it. I don't have to do anymore. I stood in front of the mirror and said, George, you made it. You'll never be broke again. Little did I know. It wasn't long afterwards. Fancy meeting you here, Fraulein. There was a quote from you, and I hope this was from you. It's certainly attributed to you. That you, uh, If it's good, it's mine. It's very good. It's very good, so I'm sure it is. Um, was that when you played the saint, you had two expressions, and that when you went to play Bond, you, uh, you used the full range of four that you developed. Did you ever say that? I think it was only three, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the period of films that you made obviously were known as much for their humour as they were for the action and the locations. Well, I, th I think that was the one difference I tried to make for myself with Sean. Sean, who's very tough, and I'm not very good at that. And, and also my attitude to that type of hero is that they don't exist, they're not real. And so I played it, you know, tongue-in-cheek. All those feathers and he still can't fly. All these action pictures have a great deal to thank the, the Bond films for, and also a lot of the stuff that they used in films. Now I see um, they, I, that kind of one-line humour that, that uh, we really initiated in there is all over. Shocking. I, I don't think there's a any modern adventure thriller that hasn't been influenced by the Bond. Um, you know, they were... The Bond movie was... broke completely new ground and for years has been in the forefront of adventure thrillers. Um, everyone's been influenced by them. Very crushing boss! Does that come with a fork? In my quest to find the real Bond, simple mathematics leads me to the man closest to 007, which by my reckoning is 006. Sean, congratulations, you get to play Agent 006, almost James Bond, as close as you can be to playing James Bond without being James Bond. Must have been a lot of fun. Was, was it ever an ambition of yours to actually be Bond himself? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's obviously something that... Uh... I'm sure a lot of people, you know, would love to play, you know. Pierce played him, had a great time playing him. He's, he's made a great bond, I think. And I suppose that's the closest I'll get playing 006. After you, 006. James? For England. For England, Alex. It must be, I suppose, it's quite strange when you, when you take on a job like that, knowing the history that goes with it and knowing how kind of devoted the fans are, is that harder yeah. for you to, to accept a job like that, knowing that you, you've got those expectations to live up to? You, you do gradually realise over the period of time when you're filming how many people actually you've got to live up to, you know, to people's expectations, you know, the baddies in Bond, you know, they've been such good baddies, and you, you want to try and match that, you know. Look after Mr Bond. See that some harm comes to him. <laughs> Won't be leaving. Bonjour, Monsieur Bond. 
I am Nick Nat. Don Perignon 64. I prefer the 62 myself. Still, beats a bag of peanuts. Monsieur Scaramanga will welcome you personally. Let me pour you some of this, Christopher. Thank you. Nice to say you haven't lost your touch. No, uh, it was not, of course, my favorite gun with which I shot the cork out of the neck of the bottle. Okay. It was an ordinary gun, if you remember, from that scene. What was it that attracted you to the part in the first place? Ian Fleming was my cousin. I, of course, had read the books, and like everybody else, immensely entertained by them all, but it meant more to me, I suppose, than almost anybody else because of the family relationship. I think that Scaramanga, unlike most of the other Bond villains, is very much Bond's dark side. I think they have quite a lot in common, certainly as far as women are concerned, certainly as far as good food, good drink, the good life is concerned, and the slight mystery about both these characters are both enigmas. Nobody's ever solved the mystery of James Bond. <coughs> what happened? Mr. Fat has just resigned. I'm the new chairman of the board. You said that um, Scaramanga was kind of the flip side of Bond, which I can see. The dark see. side, The yes. dark side. Mm. Do you think there's a case to be made that, that Bond himself couldn't exist without the villains? That you would need those, those powerful, those evil men for someone as kind of ruthless and... Yes, of course, because without them he has no... He has nothing to conquer. Compliments of Sharky. by Robbie Coltrane and yourself in the movie are less like the old villains of, of early Bond movies with, like, gimmicks and gadgets than, like, real modern-day criminals. You know, they're tough, they're mean, they're violent. Do you think that's the way that Bond villains are going to have to head uh, to be more realistic, to keep up with the current trend in action movies? Yeah, I, th I think people expect, uh, you know, the villains to be much more credible these days they, they, you know they want to see a history behind the character they want to they want to know where he's come from and why he's behaving in the way he does and uh, I think with the, the character I'm playing you know there is a history behind him he has got a grudge to bear hello James what an unpleasant surprise I always wanted to be a bad in a Bond movie in fact I mean I, when I was 16 I used to go and watch Bond movies and run around the street doing all this stuff you know and all that and had a I had a grey pull and I used to wear under a blue jacket and thought I was dead cool. But actually, I always wanted to be the bad guy. Um, I really, I wanted a big set, you know, and do all that stuff with the... Come in, Mr. Bond, sit down. Don't worry about the sharks, they have been fed. <laughs> all that stuff. Walther PPK. 765 millimeter. Only three men I know use such a gun. I believe I've killed two of them. Lucky me. Zenia on a top is her name. Zenia on a top. Mm -hmm. And when she's on a top, what does she do? Oh, she just likes to squeeze men between her thighs. <laughs> just a characteristic you share with the character? Yeah. I didn't have to dig very deep for that one. <laughs> she's a nasty piece of work. Yeah, she is. But she enjoys that work. Mm -hmm. Which I think there's probably a, a message for all of us there. Yeah, I mean, can you relate to that? Well, I think the children watching can. <laughs> yeah. The name's Bond. James Bond. Ksenia Sergeyevna Onatop. Onatop? Onatop. She just gets them in intimate positions and then she crushes their rib cages. Kind of like a nutcracker. Mm -hmm. Quite literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you.
My name's still Ross, Jonathan Ross, and I'm still in search of James Bond. But what is Bond himself in search of? Truth? Honour? Spiritual fulfilment? I'm sure he is. But it seems to me that Tasty Totty has always been pretty high on his list of mission priorities. This side to his character has been celebrated for many years by Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy magazine. I've decided to visit Hef, purely in the line of research, of course. Hef, I know that um, Playboy magazine and you personally have been fans of uh, the whole Bond phenomenon for many yeah. years. Yeah. In fact, I believe that you first started uh, serialising the Bond books before the movies even appeared. That's true. The first, uh, the first Bond story uh, appeared in 1960. What was it that attracted you to, to Bond? Well, it was a kind of a natural connection. Uh, the gadgetry, the girls, and, uh, you know, the adventure. And it has been a very good, uh, uh, long-running uh, relationship. I, I saw Dr. No. Uh, it was the first film we ever ran at the mansion in Chicago. And in the films, there was an interconnection also. In other words, uh, Ian Fleming very early said uh, that James Bond would be a, uh, a Playboy reader. You've just killed James Bond. Is that who it was? Do you think that the Bond will always be associated with the 60s as one of those key things? There was Playboy, there were the Beatles, there were the Rolling Stones, I guess, and there was James Bond. I think so. Uh, you know, I think that uh, whatever came thereafter was, was still a variation on the theme. It's, it was a, uh, an enormous uh, success and uh, very difficult to manage and handle. I mean, it, at the same time as the Beatles, more or less, and they had four of them to share it and get in and out with, and I was stuck, as it were, on my own, uh, hoisting my own petard, as it were. To live or live, die. I sat down and just started. Yeah. I actually just worked backwards from the title. In my mind, I thought, okay, we've got to end up. Da, 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 so, therefore, live and let die. So, this first bit's got to be about live and let live. Well, well, when you were young, you used to say that. And, but now you've changed your attitude to the whole world because you're James Bond now. And now you say, that, nah. so I sort of worked it like that. So, when you were young and your heart was an open book, you used to say, live and let live. You know, so, I just worked it backwards. In a way, when I think of the 60s, which I do surprisingly often, I think of the Beatles and I think of James Bond, and it did seem that they were kind of two of the greatest exports we had. Were you aware of that? Did it feel like you were sort of... Uh, at the time, I wasn't conscious of it, but looking back on some of the things I did, I must have been conscious of it, because, I mean, I immediately got an Aston Martin, and I'd never actually connected it till I saw Goldfinger. It was exactly the model I got. You'll be using this Aston Martin DB5 with modifications. Now, pay attention, please. Windscreen bulletproof, as are the side and the rear windows. Revolving number plates naturally. Well, I never thought it was such a great car myself. I uh, I found the pedals too tiny. It's like a lady's car. I, um, it was, it was, I thought it was an elegant-looking car, and uh, I remember in Switzerland. But I think that its setting in the story and in the film gave it a more unique quality than the car actually possessed. Anything else? Well, I won't keep it for more than an hour or so, if you give me your undivided attention. We've installed some rather interesting modifications. It was just the times, and it was so glamorous, and talk about pulling birds. You know, would you like to come for a ride in my DB5? <laughs> all right, all right, I'll come. But I have no idea why they're Scottish. <laughs> it sounds to me like you were just Sean, to, to pick up the female half of the crankies there. <laughs> so, <I> said, <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about the cars in the film, because yeah. when Bond fans have exhausted the Sean Connery, Roger Moore debate, if they're sad examples of Bond admirers, they move on to what was the best car, the Lotus, or the DB5. Do you have a preference? DB5. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in the movie now. In the beginning of the movie, I drive a Ferrari and we chase, do a car chasing scene. You know, see, uh, how does that happen? Because the DB5 would not stand a chance against a Ferrari in real life. I know, it? but James Bond is driving it. So you're so... just a very bad driver. No. Is it because you're I'm a woman actually driver? really good. 
I'm just giving him a, I'm pretending that, you know, he's fast. You want him to catch you? <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, I want to sort of play with him. You don't need the gun, Commander. That depends on your definition of safe sex. How do you think, uh, how do you think the, the, the female roles in the new movie compare to those in previous Bond films? Well, I think they have far improved, and all the women in the movie today, they're all women on a mission, women with an agenda, women who know what they want, and I think that um, my character resembles James Bond a lot, actually. Uh, and I really wanted that part, but Pierce snagged it away from me. Maybe they could have, yeah, you could have been Jane Bond. I wanted to be Jane Bond. I did. Now when we look at movies, you do see a lot of uh, tough female characters. I mean, it's a sort of a given yeah, in films yeah. these days. Back then, I imagine when it first... I was the appeared, first. Yeah. Isn't it customary to grant a condemned man his last request? You've asked for this. It was a, a very liberating time for women. It was the beginning. I mean, the amount of mail I used to get from both men and women. Also, of course, I had the men who were really threatened by my character. Mm who used to call me out for fights and things. And also my character, I think it was very lucky because she wasn't a bimbo. She was somebody with, with a job and somebody very effective in that job. And she saved the day, let's face it. And not many women are allowed to do much at all in Bond films, are they? No. They're usually just laid and that's that. Not, not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I mean, what I mean is, it's, it's nice when they do something else as well, but it's it's always a pleasure. They to don't see mind. That happening yes, on yes, yes, oh, yes. Who are you? My name is Pussy Galore. I must be dreaming. What about the name Pussy Galore? Because obviously, it's there's a certain humorous uh, double meaning yes, to the word, quite. There, which I think schoolboys have enjoyed yes. <laughs> ever since it was first penned. Um, were they There's always still lots of schoolboys about? Yeah. Oh, I'm afraid I'm one of them. Um, was there ever a chance that they were going to change the name, or were they always confident that they could get away with it? I never heard of any thought of ever changing it. Of course, when I did the promotion tour in America, there were some stations that wouldn't say it, and they were very po-faced about it. So I used to make a great point of saying it myself. It seems to me ridiculous with a, a silly item like an Ian Fleming story that you should take it so seriously. Not bad at all. How many times did it take Sean Connery to get his hat on there as when he was Bond? Once. It took him 27 times, and then they handed the hat over to the property man. You see, I'm more a man than he ever was. Well, I'm not telling anybody how many times you've practised. OK, yeah, but it wasn't, it wasldn't <laughs> bad once the camera no, was running. No, that was excellent. Do you have fond memories of your years with Bond? I'm sure you do, because you were in, was it 14 of the movies 14. as Money Penny? 14. I have very fond uh, memories. I was treated like uh, a sort of queen mum of the Bond set. For your eyes only can see me through the night For your eyes only I never need to hide What did you make of the Bond girls as, uh, as part of the Bond ingredient? How important do you think they were? Oh, I think they were terribly important because they were every man's fantasy, weren't they? I mean, every man in the whole world wanted a blonde with big bosoms and long legs and... At least one. At least one, yeah. And what about Money Penny? What did Money Penny make of, of James Bond's uh, unquenchable thirst for new flesh? Well, I think Money Penny was uh, initially hurt, but then just took it in her stride. I've never seen you after hours, Money Penny. Lovely. Thank you, James. Out on some kind of professional assignment, dressing the kill? They all find this crushing, 007. But I don't sit at home every night praying for some international incident so I can run down here all dressed up to impress James Bond. I was on a date, if you must know, with a gentleman. We went to the theatre together. Oh, money, Penny, I'm devastated. What would I ever do without you? 
far as I can remember, James, you've never had me. The, uh, the, the various pictorials you featured over the years of Bond girls. Mm -hmm. Is this a kind of official relationship you have here, or is it just kind of happy coincidence that the women are prepared to pose for Playboy and that... It depends on the circumstances. In other words, there's certainly always been a, a, a close relationship with uh, the producers of the films and with Ian. Uh, whether or not we got the, the, the leads did depend very much on, on the actresses. But uh, we've been very fortunate in that over the years. And, of course, there's some classic examples like Ursula Andress and Kim Basinger, who actually had their careers uh, created in a real way through the combination of the Bond films and their appearance in Playboy. There was always a tie-in between uh, the Bond films and Playboy, Playboy magazine. Would you have done a nude or semi-nude Playboy spread? Oh, yes, in those days I would have, because I certainly needed the money. It seemed to me, Famke, that the women appeared in Bond movies almost always appeared semi-clad or completely naked in Playboy magazine, and I'm just curious and a little bit hopeful, I don't know, <laughs> have they asked you, would you be doing that? They, they asked me and I declined, yes. I, I'm not interested. Well, they did ask me, actually, once. Playboy asked you? And no, Cosmopolitan had, you know, had the centre page spread. Burt Reynolds, I think, was oh, the yeah. first. And they said they were... But, <laughs> that would be covered up by my holding a luger. Because they never had them completely nude, did they? There was always something, yeah, something skewing there. the, yeah, the I, centre I fold. suggested that not even a machine gun. Not me. No, no interest? No. Even if they kept the ankles covered? Maybe we could talk then. <laughs> played against some of the world's most beautiful women. I mean, you had some of the most fabulous women playing against you. Fond memories of, of those days, of making those films? Yeah, because uh, you'd have a lot of laughs, you know, because the, you know, love scenes on, on, on movies are, are really a joke. You know, how can you be serious about it when you've got sort of 45 sparks leaning down over the rail at you, you know? Go oh, on, give her one, Rog. Can I ask you about that? Because hey, actors always say, whenever you ask an actor about a love scene and you say, you know, here you are, you're completely nude with this uh, beautiful woman, or in your case, not nude, but you've got Famke, once again, legs wrapped firmly round your midriff, sir. Yes. I put it to you that this is indeed a pleasurable way to spend the day and not the hard work you would have us believe. Oh, you think you can hurt me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that scene was just, that scene was a tough scene because it's a fighting scene, but you're not sure if they're kind of, yeah. you know, you're doing sure. the beast with two backs or... They're enjoying the... it at the same time. Yeah, sure, she's, she's got a nice body, it's very nice. So how can that possibly be tough? Well, it's tough because you can't show any breasts in, in these movies, so you have to make sure that the breast is covered and lying there, and so it becomes very technical. Yeah, I mean, you might... look, you're a boy, you look, you have certain sensations, certain things you have to... More water, please. <laughs> It seems to me that now in the 90s, it's, it's OK again for a man to admit that he wants to be like James Bond. He wants to be tough and rough, and he wants to get the girls, ideally, plural. Mm. Um, but I wonder whether, do you think that women identify with the women in Bond movies again? Do you think we've come full circle like that? I shouldn't think the women identify with women in Bond movies, because most of them are bimbos. And I think that the, the feminist cry is still in full cry, I hope. You know, and these, uh, the new man, uh, the new lad, the new, the young man of today, does he want to drive very, very fast cars and lots of beautiful women want to go to bed with them and, and go around shooting people? Yes. Yes, I think, uh, I think, uh, I mean, there might be one or two boys brought up in a feminist crash who think, heavens, is that the time I must get on with the ironing? But most of them are going, what the hell are they? I'm afraid. There was an increased sensibility related to the political climate in the 80s, so that uh, uh, James Bond became uh, a little politically a little too correct 
And you can't do that with Bond. I mean, what is delightful about Bond is it's a fantasy. I mean, if you're going to have the license to kill, you better have the license to do whatever else you got to do to, <laughs> <laughs> to play out the role. I mean, what would be more interesting, perhaps, is ask, ask how many women would like to be a Bond girl now. And I think you'll find that would be the big change. I mean, they would want to win Bond, but they would rather be a pussy galore in as much as she would be somebody who would approach him on an equal level. People want to see Bond handle women a certain way. He's a chauvinist. This guy acquits himself, true to himself, and that's what turned the audience on way back when Sean did it. You think I'm an accountant, a bean counter, more interested in my numbers than your instincts? The thought had occurred to me. Good, because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War whose boyish charms, though wasted on me, obviously appealed to that young woman I sent out to evaluate you. Point taken. Despite what we've seen so far, James Bond doesn't spend all his waking hours squiring keen young ladies and duffing up oddly shaped villains. Commander Bond has a proper day job, spying. Espionage fact or espionage fiction? General Anthony Stone, one of Britain's finest counter-espionage experts, would help me to find out how true to life Bond's spy work really is. Apparently, when the films began to appear and became so hugely popular in the 60s, there were those within the Russian intelligence services who just couldn't believe how accurate some of the information the films were. Good work. Were you aware of that? Did it seem quite accurate? Did it seem like they knew what was really going on? I think there was uh, a degree of, of suspicion uh, amongst some that there was rather more information in some of these films than was uh, uh, good for us all. But uh, don't forget Fleming's background was one of mixing with people who um, did have a certain contact with various others, so no doubt he, he inserted his own bits of information as he, as he saw fit. After all, Bond was, in a way, a part of Ian. Ian was a man of enormous charm, tremendous physical presence. He had a great knowledge of that very strange grey world which Bond inhabited with M and all the others, the world of espionage. He knew his food and his drink, he was very attractive to women, and he also knew how to write a very good thriller, a good yarn. I hope our work here meets with your approval. Training is useful, but there is no substitute for experience. I agree, we use live targets as well. He seems fit enough. Have him report to me in Istanbul in 24 hours. Did it make it easy for you? Was it good for morale that Bond was coming up against such evil, weasley, low-life villains? Oh, terrific. Absolutely perfect. I mean, the, the fact that uh, we had this ideological split between us uh, and that the Bond film portrayed the enemies on the other side was perfect. I mean, it, it just kept the balance nice and it made us all feel uh, very much on Bond's side. What about the, the, the whole... Um image of espionage put forward in the Bond movies as being glamorous, as exciting and full of gimmicks. Well, I mean, I certainly don't have any first-hand experience, you know, <laughs> of that. But uh, I think, uh, you know, there was actually quite an, inter an interesting influence of uh, this James Bond image and the James Bond stereotype on the way, for example, the KGB agents behaved, you know, because, uh, well, I think they actually tried, maybe subconsciously, but probably consciously rather, to imitate James Bond, or rather their perception of James Bond. Because, I don't know if you remember, you know, the whole atmosphere, say, in Moscow was uh, that of a thriller. I know you, you would talk in clandestine, esoteric, uh, ciphered language to each other. 
In London, April's a spring month. Oh, yeah? And what are you, the weatherman? And for crying out loud, another stiff-ass Brit with your secret codes and your passwords. <laughs> One of these days, you guys are going to learn just to drop it. Bond then created a whole spy phenomenon. Uh, they were everywhere. Um, let me ask you about the, the gimmicks and the gadgets, such a, a huge part of the appeal of the James Bond movies. How much of it in the films um, has a, a real-life counterpart? Not a great deal. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of artistic license from the entertainment point of view, but there's a thread of, of truth and a, an element of realism uh, in almost everything that goes on. This is now being issued as standard equipment. Strap it on your wrist. It's activated by nerve impulses from the wrist muscles. Like this? Very novel, Kira. We must get them in the stores for Christmas. Good morning, gentlemen. There's something about gadgets that... I They just go wrong for me. I don't know why. Having problems keeping it up, Q? Experimental model. I mean, even these damn keys that you have in hotels. You know, you don't have a proper key anymore, have this plastic thing. Well, I could never make the damn things work. Do, do they ever go wrong in a way that actually is, is uh, potentially harmful? Uh, yes, on Spy Who Loved Me, with, with Kurt Jurgens when he's sitting down at the end of the table. The Sit audience knows that he's going to shoot something up a tube from one end of the table to the other. I said, I think, I think there's more suspense. Whereas if I, I sit in it, then I'll leap out of the chair before it explodes. So you got yourself into this particular I got it. Well, you see, the back of the chair was, was steel-plated to protect me from the explosion. And so I started out of the chair, and the explosion went. They went before I got out of the chair. They blew me out of the chair. And they also blew three holes you know where. And I was writhing around on the floor with smoke coming out of my rear end. I was on fire. So it was all just a ruse then, essentially. This was just a chance for you to get a loan and have cream rubbed in by the studio nurse. Well, of course. She was very beautiful. <laughs> Do you get to see all the gimmicks beforehand, or are they no. as much a surprise to you as they are They're to the audience? They're much surprises as they are to the audience, yes. So what about the first time you saw Little Nelly? How did that come about? We went out to Japan to do that scene, and on Sunday we had the day off, and we went to the local aerodrome for lunch. And suddenly I heard a sort of odd noise, and I thought the Japs were mowing the lawn. I thought it's pretty odd, you know, on a Sunday. Somebody said, oh, that's little Nelly arriving. And I said, well, you know, what the hell's little Nelly? I have much curiosity, Bolsa. What is little Nelly? Oh, she's a wonderful girl, very small, quite fast. Can do anything, just your type. A toy helicopter? No, it's certainly not a toy. How did you first get involved in the whole Bond setup with little Nelly and um, you only live twice? Well, it was entirely by chance. I was going to take part in a, a spaghetti 007 film that was to be shot in Brazil. And Tony Scase, who did radio interviews in those days, came to see me and he recorded the aircraft flying around before I went out there. And at the end of the chat that we had, he said, would you like to have a fight with a helicopter for one can? <laughs> I said, give me half a chance, Tony. and things they all yeah, they all fired many times in the film yeah. can i climb in yes certainly <sighs> you know i haven't flown one of these for years ken <laughs> <laughs> oh, i'll come back to you very quickly yes you don't never forget just like falling off a log <laughs> oh there we are oh well let's go uh, start me up right are you ready D-51 
you think um, James Bond would have liked his life to be a little more like yours? Or would you have liked your life to be a little more like his? Well, I, <laughs> I think that probably it would work. I think probably he, he would rather probably have been living my life. I think, quite <laughs> frankly, my license was better than the one for killing. And your license has never been revoked, I understand. That's correct. Looking at Goldeneye, the finished object now, do you have a favourite moment? Is there a favourite scene which, which you're involved in that you really like, you think really works as well, if not better than you expected? You know, a lot of good moments. I mean, it was just great to be working on. You know, the first day when I went in and me and Pierce were in the costume together, the combat gear, I'm, I'm watching his back and he's watching mine, you know, setting his watches. You know, I thought, oh, I can't believe this. This is, uh, you know, this is, this is great. I can't believe you're doing a Bond movie. <laughs> yeah. Shut the door, Alec, there's a draft. Alec? Move out. Throw down your weapon and walk towards me. It's Laurie. Finish the job, James. Blow them all to hell. Is there one moment, one particular scene which you would consider to be a favourite? The golf scene in Goldfinger. Oh, uh, I believe this is yours. Uh, live and let die. <laughs> the opening sequence with those fabulous song plays. It was very catchy. I think that smashing and the girl sort of burns. I think it's a very good sequence, that. <laughs> Ursula Andress walking out the sea. I'm sorry. I actually saw her in Paris once. She was getting to this huge Bentley when I was a smelly old student. And I just, I don't know why, I just went, Ursula, baby! And she went, and she went, I think the one in its time frame that was probably the most memorable was the one where he suddenly put on that jet operation on, on his back and went disappearing off into the sky, and that was a, a great escape. The scene where, where Connery's on the slab, strung out, and the laser beam is coming up between his legs. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Probably golfing with the big laser. That laser sequence, you know, is very... Isn't it funny how all the men who see Bond movies remember the laser sequence? Well, it's a very threatening sequence, that, you know, as it nears his crutch. I mean, I think we all... What is it about Bond and the Bond movies that have proved to be just so popular over the years? Uh, well, it's, you know, it's a question I've been asked quite often, and the only answer I can think is that uh, they're virtually all the same. Uh, the audience get what they pay for. It is big, it's spectacular, the locations are spectacular, the action is enormous. But it's the same story dressed up in a different fashion. You mustn't change things, so people are very, very disappointed if they didn't have the same formula. But you dress it up in a different way, that's all. Sex, violence, yeah, that's all the good stuff. Pure fantasy. And everything is bigger and better than life. Bond did it right from the very beginning. Uh, the construction of the films, uh, the use of the prologue at the very beginning, the way they set it up, the use of the music, the Bond theme, the look of the films, the sets, uh, they did it right from the very beginning. Harry Saltzman always used to say that men went out of the cinema walking tall, and uh, I think women uh, fancy Bond, and that's that. It's quite simple, really. So there you have it, James Bond, 
the man with the license to kill, thrill and cavort with handsome young ladies, and also that we residents of this island can sleep safely in our beds. So just who is he? 007's been played by five actors, all of whom contributed to his personality, but ultimately, he's bigger than all of them. Die Hard will die with Willis. Terminator will be terminated with Schwarzenegger, but 007 is different. As long as men want to do what they're not really supposed to do, he'll be around. You might call the latest movie Goldeneye, but to me, it's Dr. No 17. Yes, in this ever-changing world in which we live in, where iron curtains must rust, cold wars must thaw, there will always be room for Bond. James Bond.